Please join with me in our prayer of confession. The words of Isaiah remind us in vivid terms that the God of justice cannot endure solemn assemblies that hold on to iniquity. We confess that our hands may be stained with sins that are like scarlet, crimson, red, hands that need to be washed to be like bright wool, as beautiful as fresh snow. God of mercy, remove the evil of our doings so we may learn to do good. God of mercy, remove confusion from our doings so we may seek justice. God of mercy, remove fear from our doings so we may rescue the oppressed. God of mercy, remove hopelessness from our doings so we may defend the orphan. God of mercy, remove complacency from our doings so we may plead for the widow. One of the ways we take time to be holy is to have some silent time where we make space for God to be with us. So shall we be in a few moments of silent prayer together? The scriptures remind us, when we confess our sins, God is faithful and God is just. And God will forgive us of all the wrong we have done and all the good that we have not done. This is the firm foundation of our faith. This is the amazing grace that Christ brought to us, to each one of us. And in that grace we find forgiveness in this moment and in all times. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our opening hymn is one of my favorite ones, How Firm a Foundation, and please stand as you are able as we sing this hymn.
village, where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, so she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. May God add God's blessing and understanding to these words. Amen.
the, the difficulty I have with this uh, particular game is that I would have a really difficult time limiting it to three people. There are so many interesting, fascinating, wonderful people that I think would be great to spend time with and have a meal with. And I, I thought of a few of those people today in preparation for this service. I would, I would love to have dinner with Francis of Assisi because I really like his gentle spirituality and I like his love for animals and for nature. I'd love to sit down with Teresa of Avila because she reminded us that we are God's hands and God's eyes and God's voice and God's love in a world that really needs so much of God's love right now. I'd like to sit down with Ben Franklin. I think he was an interesting man and creative and inventor and he played such an important role in American history. And I'd like to sit down with Abraham Lincoln, who I admire a lot and would love to learn more about his life. And Harriet Tubman, I want to thank her for being one of the leaders of the Underground Railroad and for her sense of justice. And to celebrate that her picture is going to be on our $20 bills in 2020. I'd like to meet the inventor of the slinky because I always wonder how do those things go down those stairs? <laughs> I think it'd be really nice to have dinner with Dolly Parton. She just projects so much energy and fun. She's down to earth and compassionate and kind. And she strikes me as being one of those persons who brightens up a room and makes life better because of the energy she brings to it. And it would be really fun to belt out some gospel songs with Dolly Parton. I'd like to meet Aretha Franklin because I love her voice and uh, her music touches my soul so deeply. And I'd like to have lots of music, so I'd want Elton John to be there, and Olivia Newton-John, and Patti LaBelle, and Tina Turner, and Hugh Jackman. <laughs> I'm almost done with my list. I, I'd also want to invite uh, Serena and Venus Williams and Roger Federer because they're my favorite tennis players. And I think any party would, would be a lot of fun if Betty White were there. <laughs> and after, after the meal, we could sit down and we could play passwords. Of course, I would want to have dinner with Jesus. Who wouldn't want to sit down and have dinner with Jesus? Certainly the first disciples got the chance to do that, actually, in person. But as I, I read the scripture today that Don so beautifully read for us, I, I wondered, how, how would I respond if Jesus were in the house? What would I do? What would it be like for me to have Jesus in my home? That made me think a little bit about my parents and their hospitality. My parents liked to have uh, barbecues and parties and invite people over. And they were great um, uh, hospi hospitable entertainers and, and provided great meals. They kind of had three guidelines, I think, when they had people over for a meal. First, make sure you have enough food. Make sure your house is clean and be attentive to the needs of your guests. Those were really, I think, the three guidelines that they use. So I, I think if Jesus came for a meal, I would probably entertain like my parents did. I would want to make sure there's enough food. I would want to make sure the house was clean. I would want to make sure my lawn was mowed. I'd want to make sure there, there were enough beverages and, and food for the guests. Although, be, because Jesus has been known to multiply food before, if I ran a little short, I suppose I could. <laughs> ask him to help me out. Um, I'd want to vacuum the pool. I have a swimming pool and I'd want to make sure it was clean in case he wanted to swim in it or perhaps walk on it. <laughs> but most of all, I'd want to be attentive to my guests. I think I'm kind of a Martha kind of host. I want to make sure everything's ready, everything's in place, all the preparations have been made. I also think that, like Martha, I, I have to be careful. Careful that I don't get so caught up in, in the preparations and making sure everything is ready and set and neat and clean and in place that I neglect the guest who has come to visit me. That's really what this particular story is all about. That Jesus, I think, isn't saying that hospitality is a bad thing. In fact, we know it's a good thing. And when we invite people to our homes, it's good to be prepared and, and good to have set an environment where people feel welcomed and invited and cared and loved. But I think in the story, Jesus is basically saying, 
Don't let any kind of busyness in your lives, even, even good things, even good work, even the service you're doing for others, get in the way of being with God, of taking time to be with God, taking time to be with Jesus. Because as he tells both Martha and Mary, that's the most important portion. That's the most important thing, is that we make time in our lives to be with God. And that's the time that God can transform us. At Old South Church, which again is the church where Sue and I met, on the Sunday bulletins, they, they put uh, these words. There's a warning on the front of these bulletins. And you read this as you enter. And it's, it's really important. So I want to read it to you. Basically, um, it says this. And this is on every Sunday bulletin. It says, warning. To enter into the life of this people of God is to encounter God's soul-challenging, life-changing, radicalizing love. Will you join us? Will you dare? When I think about all of the violence and the, the hatred and the discrimination that we have experienced in our country and around the world in the last few months, I think that this is exactly what our world needs. This is exactly what we need that we need to spend time with God, the source of love, so that we can be transformed, so that our souls can be challenged and our lives can be changed, and our love, not our hate, become radicalized. I think this happens when we make space for God in our lives, when we take time to really be with God, to be with Jesus. When we spend time with God, when we create that space, however we create that space, we are putting ourselves in a place, in a relationship, where God can transform us and change us and help us to become the people God wants us to become. It's because when we put ourselves close to God that we may change, that that may be why it's sometimes easier for us to stay in the kitchen than to actually go out and sit with Jesus as Mary did. If we put ourselves in a relationship with God that's consistent and we make space for God consistently and faithfully, we, want, we, we run the risk that that is going to change us and that God is going to challenge us like he did the early disciples. If we spend a lot of time with God and we make space for God, we may be challenged to leave our nets behind and to take up a cross and to follow Jesus. We might be challenged to turn our swords into plowshares and our spears into pruning hooks. We might be challenged to forgive someone who has hurt us. We might be challenged to accept someone we might not want to accept. We might be challenged to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with God. We might be challenged to really believe and really put into practice that we are all children of God and that God calls us to treat each other with humility and kindness and compassion and respect. We might be challenged to love God with all the fullness of our being and to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. When we get close to God, when we spend time with Jesus, we may be challenged to make some difficult and radical changes. The late theologian Marcus Borg said that in Jesus we get to see what God looks like. I think what he meant by that is that when we see Jesus we get to see what's important to God. We get to see what God valued, values, how God wants us to live and how God wants us to change our lives. In Jesus we get to see how God has given us potential to change. It is because of that that it might be easier to stay away from God sometimes and put some distance there. Henry Nowen talks about this in a book that he calls um, A Spirituality of Living. And in that book, he writes this. He says, Our lives are full. There are things to do, people to meet, activities to pursue, we want to be fully occupied, to know that because we are busy people, something important is happening in our lives. And if we are not occupied, then we are at least preoccupied, filled with concern about things that have not yet come about or have already come about. 
We fill our inner space with worry about things that might happen and guilt about things that have already happened. And beneath our worry and our guilt, there's a deep fear of empty spaces. He goes on to say that for many of us, our inner lives, our spiritual lives, are like a banana tree filled with monkeys jumping up and down. I know I sometimes feel that way myself. Sometimes I get so busy with commitments and appointments and responsibilities and, and chores and taking care of a house and a lawn and a swimming pool that it's easy sometimes to get so preoccupied, as Martha did, by even good things that we, we don't make time for God. We don't create a space uh, for God to be present and us to be present to God. So Jesus, again, is not saying that hospitality is a bad thing. But Jesus is saying, make sure that you make time in your life somehow, make space to be with God so that you can get direction for your life, so you can get comfort and sustenance, and so that you can be transformed and be the lights of the world that I want you to be. One of my favorite psalms is Psalm 139, and I, I want to read part of that to you because I think this psalm reminds us that that God is always with us in all times, in all places, and in all spaces. It's we who sometimes are not aware of that, but, but God is always with us. And the, the words of the psalm, the initial verses, which you'll probably recommend, uh, remember because it's such a, a popular psalm, go, go like this. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and you know when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down. You are acquainted, O oh God, with all of my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, you, O oh Lord, know it all together. You go before me and behind me, you lay your hand on me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit, O oh God? But where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. This is a, a wonderful reminder, I think, that God is always with us. In effect, God is always in the house. God is always in our lives whether we are aware of it or not. One of the things we affirm through the baptism of infants, for instance, is that God is already involved in this little baby's life.